I didn't sleep at all last night and my throat is just on fire my skin's hurting and I generally just feel very unwell I'm not looking forward to hiking 16 kilometers today Reaching the Kungsleden is an adventure in itself, with our first leg of the journey involving a flight from London to Stockholm. Located in the northernmost section of Sweden, in the heart of Lapland, there are numerous methods for reaching Abisko, which is at the start of the trail in the north. We'd chosen to catch the overnight train, which had us sharing a six-berth cabin with a young German couple who were also heading to Abisko. And you organised the trip by internet or you're just friends from many years ago and you met last year <laughs> last year they were living in a van cool we were living in a car <laughs> now you live in a train <laughs> and a train. tent <laughs> it was autumn 2014 when we met cody and justina in the lofoten islands of northern norway a chance conversation through Twitter turned into a campfire on the beach and it was six months later in Germany when we hashed out plans to all walk the trail together. The Kungsleden is one of the most well-known trails in Sweden, with many people exploring it during the summer and winter seasons. We've just arrived at Abisko Mountain Station. Uh, the weather's really nice. It's nice and cool, brilliant hiking weather. And yeah, I can't wait to get on the trail. I'm feeling surprisingly fresh after a 20 hour train journey. <laughs> 15, exactly. 15. I wish it was 13. Well, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> 24. Oh, oh. my. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. Are you going to survive? No. No. The Swedish Tourist Association created the trail in the early 1900s as a way to bring more people into the last largest remaining wilderness in Europe, gradually adding more sections to the trail as years went by until it reached its current length of 440 kilometres in the 1970s. It's possible to hike the trail with limited food during the open season to lighten your load, as many cabins have small shops with basic supplies which are run by the hut wardens during the open season. This method can be quite costly, which is why many people hike with five to seven days worth of food at a time and can instead buy luxury items such as coke or extra chocolate from the cabin stores. We're in a Bisco Euro, which is the first hut of the trail, 15 kilometers in and totally knackered. Looking forward to some dinner. <laughs> SDF has 21 cabins placed from Abisko to Hemavan along the Kungsleden, providing shelter for a small fee with shared accommodation, water sources and camping spots. Many also have saunas and small shops, which is a real benefit after a long day's hiking. slept really well last night. All of us did, I think. Uh, even though I was up till quite late, watching the Northern Lights was just incredible to see that on our first night on the Kungsleden. A 20 kilometer day to Alasiara is accomplished with 300 meters elevation on towards a windswept alpine and blueberry infused meadow with views overlooking the Norwegian peaks over the border. The 
possibility of completing the entire trail during September looked thin. A number of people had told us we may need to step off the trail at Quick Yock halfway through the trip. Alasiara has a fantastic water system, drawing water up the hill from the river to allow hikers easy access to fresh water. Day is really fresh. Icy cold. We began the slow and steady ascent towards the highest area of the entire trail, arriving at the small cabin at Chakcha, snow still clinging to the mountainside in large quantities, adding a chill to the air. So we just arrived and had lunch at the hut. It's our third day on the Kungsleden and it was really nice weather again today, which was brilliant. We've got our own room, which is amazing. So we should be able to get a really nice night's sleep. And down here, we've got some wood. Uh, there's a wood burner just behind me, which is really cool. Keep the room nice and toasty throughout the night. The weather's not too good tomorrow, it's forecast to rain, so you just gotta bear that in mind and wrap up warm. Everyone contributes to the huts by chopping wood, sweeping the floors and fetching fresh water from the rivers. Reaching a height of 1,100 metres, Chakcha Pass is the highest point along the Kungsleden. From its summit, there are majestic views of Chakcha Valley, a beautiful area which will take a couple of days to walk through. At around 32 kilometres long, the glacial valley is well loved by many. As impressive mountains line the sides, waterfalls make their way into the meandering river and the cabin settlement at Solka is situated 12 kilometres from Chakcha, with reindeer grazing on the hillside. The thing is though, like when you've been hiking for four days and you get a big meal like this, it just makes all the difference because you just feel powered, ready for the next section. So we're going to eat in 26 more days. <laughs> Couscous. <laughs> The northernmost section of the trail is by far the most popular, and thousands of people each year split off the Kungsleden at Singi to venture past and ascent, if they feel up to it, Mount Kebnekaiser, Sweden's highest mountain. From here, they end their journey at Nikoluokta. Passing Singi, the crowd's noticeably thin and continue to do so for the remainder of the trail. My legs are in agony today. It's so hard on this rocky path. It's just uh, relentless, but. Um, hopefully the next hut is about a kilometre away, we still can't see it, but really fingers crossed we haven't got too much to go. <laughs> I had begun to have troubles of tendonitis in my hip, an old injury which had flared up after a few days, and unfortunately, running out of painkillers, there was nothing to numb the pain. One day they go over the water and here. Yeah. And here, and now in winter they are there. Okay. <laughs> is it is it a mother yeah. and, and baby or or two big no, ones? No, they are two mothers oh. and two. Two uh, big. No, two men. Okay. <laughs> oh, awesome, maybe two ladies. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <that's better. laughs> Moose sighting today, Katumiore. Uh, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, we were skiing in, uh, was it last year? And we were at Kebnekaisa. Yeah. And it was deep snow, and I was going first, and it's going downhill. And so I ski around the corner, and she had crashed, so I'm kind of waiting for her. I come around the corner, and then, yeah, two elk. Oh, God. There, and then they get up out of the snow and kind of look at me for a second. I'm like, oh, shit, like, she's back there somewhere. And I have to go, like, that way, but the elk are in between. I'm like, uh, Yeah, I'm, like, lying stuck, stuck with, my, with my skis. I couldn't move, and, oh, gosh. Yeah. But it looks like the story turned out well. Yeah, I yeah, didn't, yeah. didn't get run over, so. Okay. Yeah. So mm. if you want to see them in the morning, when do we have to get up? Yes. I come here and <laughs> wake us up. Yeah. By now we covered roughly 73 kilometers of the trail. And even though it was only a nine kilometer hike from Katamyara to Tessayara, it was taking its toll on Theo, who was battling a fluey cold. I'm not looking forward to hiking 16 kilometers today. There are seven boat crossings included along the length of the Kungsleden, with the first you reach coming from the north at Tessayara. There's the option to row, but that cuts into your hiking time, and if you're feeling the effects of illness like Theo, then it's worth the luxury to pay for a ride and reserve your energy levels. Panoramic glacial views of Sarek National Park come into view across the plateau, a glimpse of the wildest part of Europe. After the steep descent towards Vakatavara, it's a 30 km bus ride to Kebnats on the shore of Lake Langas. For 70 crowns, you can bypass a day's trek along the roadside, which everyone seems to do. It's a 10 minute ferry ride across the lake to the mountain station at Saltaluokta. Here lies a popular gateway for many to enter Sarek National Park, an area with no designated trails and complete wilderness. Saltaluokta is the first place to recharge camera gear, and we made the most to have the modern amenities at the lodge. You gotta keep the blisters clean, otherwise they get infected and I'll be in pain. Well, a lot more pain than I already am in. The impressive lodge was built in 1918 and offers hikers the chance to restock their supplies for the coming days in their well-stocked shop. Views overlooking Siofilsdalen provided a stunning backdrop as we left Saltiruokta, with 66 kilometres to go until our halfway point at Krikjok. A late summer seemed to have descended upon us, so we took our time to reach Sitiara.
So we're about nine kilometers into the hike today. We've got another 11 to go. We've just took some shelter from the wind in this little cabin, which is really cool. We cooked a mugshot and now we're gonna head off. Should take us about two hours to get to our destination for tonight. Hopefully some Northern Lights action tonight as well. That would be really nice. With only 11 kilometers to go, I had to slow it down with my tendinitis. The pain was unbearable. Once I reached the cabin, I immediately went to bed whilst Theo joined Justina as she bathed her sore ankle in the lake. Her injury seemed to be worsening as the days went by, slowing her down and having to share more of her load with Cody. Ah! Oh my... Oh. Ah. Ah. That is cold. So cold. Ah! Oh. Yara has a private boat service run by a local family, but there's also the option to row for free. I was here two years and a day ago. Same weather, perfect conditions. I thought it would be cool to shoot a time lapse as I rowed the boat over the lake. Except for my camera didn't quite agree, nor did the boat, and my camera decided to go swimming in the lake, which resulted in the end of that trip. Hopefully this time I make up for it with Perfect northern lights with my tent on the top of Skirfe, and that'll be worth the $5,000 price tag that it cost me last time. <laughs> English? Uh, English. Okay. Are you hiking together? Yeah. yeah. All four of you? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What country are you from? Germany? Uh, we're from England. Okay. But I'm from California. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yes, so let's go. Yeah. Considering it's a four kilometre journey, the 200 crown price tag is worth it if it means less time spent on the water and the opportunity for some insider knowledge. You will see them coming. As long as you just don't stand and wave it because then it will be afraid. Yeah. Just behind a rock or something like no place and sit still, then they will pass you. We've been informed by the boat operator of the Sami herding an enormous reindeer herd down to lower ground that day. So we made our way swiftly to the plateau to find a spot to watch the incredible sight. Hot, sweaty, and I'm looking forward to a coke. We were just surrounded by a thousand reindeer sitting on top of a pretty big rock, but could have been a little bit bigger. <laughs> a few rogue ones over there. Yeah, there's usually a few rogues. Did you see it? Yeah, we saw the whole thing. It looked very daredevil on that rock. <laughs> <laughs> did how close did they get? Yeah. So oh, close. Surrounding us. Really? And they're, and they're, it looked like amazing from over here. Still on a high from the incredible sight they'd witnessed, Theo and Cody took a popular detour from the trail to the famous Skurfa with stunning views over Rapidolin. 
everyone's told us it's impossible to camp up here because it's too rocky. But I think I've found a few spots that should be doable. If you're in a one-person tent, there's lots of places, but two-person tent might be a little tricky. Otherwise, find a nice flat rock and have an open-air bivy and watch the northern lights overhead from the warmth of the sleeping bags. I don't think life gets much better than that. I think right here. A little bit up. A couple of rocks, but I think it's gonna be our best bet for our the lack of water sources within the surrounding area, combined with the rocky landscape, makes camping out atop Skurfa a challenge in itself, but it's undoubtedly worth it. Justina and I had carried on towards the cabin at Axed. With a swollen ankle and tendonitis between us, it was vital we rest as much as possible or else risk having to drop out. Looking good. Home for the night. A little bit crooked, home. But home. Which side do you want? Upside or downside? I don't mind. Do you want to roll onto me or be rolled on by me? <laughs> we got couscous tonight, pretty much every night. Pretty bored of it right now, to be honest. But it gets me full. It was a bit windy last night. I'm almost out of water, two sips left to hike the six kilometers back to the hut. Got a bit of a head cold, but yeah, it's worth being up. Wouldn't trade this for anything. Theo and Cody joined us in Axed, where they had a chance to catch up on the little sleep they'd had the night before, after watching the northern lights atop Skurfa. One kilometre from Axed lies Lake Latura, which we crossed on the last operational day of the STF motorboat. There is now only seven days left until the rowboats are pulled from the lakes for winter storage, meaning our group must reach Hornavan on the outskirts of Yakvik, roughly 117 kilometres away before then, where the only option of crossing the lake is by rowboat. The journey over the lake is the fourth boat crossing along the trail, and with Sarek looming in the background, it's one of the most stunning. Uh, this is a flowing bridge, okay. so maximum three person at a time, okay. or okay. it will sink. Yes, yes. not uh. well. yeah. It's a strenuous hike towards Porter, but it's also through a thin stretch of the eastern section of Sarek National Park. Fields of blueberries surround the path. We even saw evidence of a nearby brown bear after passing its scat on the trail. We didn't know it at the time, but these would be our last days hiking together.
So after a long discussion uh, yesterday evening, Cody and Justina have come to the decision that it's probably best that they end the trail here due to Justina's ongoing uh, leg injury. She's been struggling for a while and can't carry on any further. So they're gonna stop here, we're gonna carry on. And we're excited to get to Hemavan eventually. We're nearly halfway and can't wait to see what the South has to offer. Other than the prospect of an early onset of winter, injury was the second biggest factor in ending the trail prematurely. It was with a heavy heart that we parted ways. As Cody was struggling with the weight of his pack and Justina's ankle had worsened, they opted to take a bus to Amarnas 166 kilometres away, have some rest and possibly rejoin from there to complete the southernmost section of the trail. So please come here. Um, so. If you come, yeah. Yeah, Matt. Do you want to take the camera? I, I'll take the camera. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. And life jacket? No, it's not necessary. The Kungsleden begins again on the other side of Sagat Lake, with the only option across via a private boat service, which also offers tours of the area. So how far are you hiking today? Um, somewhere between 15 to 20 kilometers. All right. Depending how we feel. Yeah, I see. Yes. Can I go to Bry? Jag blev lite försenad. Jag var tvungen att vänta på folk. Så kan ni gå till bryggan? Den. Så, var ska jag sätta den? Ja, nej, det var du. Ja. Mm. Varsågod. Mm. Mm. Okej. Okay. Bjorn was a friendly guy who shared a ton of information with us regarding the next section of the trail to Yakvik. What kind of um, wildlife do you get around here? Yeah, we have uh, rangers, of course, and the wolverines, and the elks, uh, otters, and so a lot of different kind of fish, and um, hares, and a lot of birds, owls, etc. Both um, the Sea Eagle and Golden ID. Oh, wow. Yeah. After being roped into an extensive 45 minute tour of the Delta, we finally made our way into the section of the Kungsleden dubbed the toughest. 166 kilometres with no SDF cabins means that a tent is a necessity. Leaving Quickyok, it seemed everyone's concerns over the onset of an early winter were squashed, as autumn still rained high in the mountains. The possibility of completing the entire Kungsleden Trail were now high, and with that thought running through our minds, it gave us a new push to reach the end. Even though this, uh, this is a really nice shelter, we've had a late lunch and there's still quite a few hours of daylight left so we're just going to carry on because we want to reach the boat before the really bad weather hits on Friday and the boats are getting pulled on Friday or Saturday anyway so we're keen to just get there and get it over with. <laughs> After another 10 to 15 kilometers, we set up camp next to a river, relieved to have made it so far that day and to escape into the tent just before the rain started.
this looks like a pretty good spot. Good to see the sun's made an appearance after it's been pissing it down all day. Oh. Probably like one of the best smashes we've had. It tastes really, really smashy. <laughs> the butter and potato is very strong in this one. <laughs> you start to notice these things when you've had a couple of different varieties. And these vegetables so much. I find myself thinking about like salad and vegetables <laughs> when I'm walking along sometimes. Sometimes, all the time. Just like peas, potatoes, carrots, peppers, sweet potato, mushrooms, onions, garlic, just fresh stuff. Living out of packets fun for the first day and then after a while it gets a bit tedious. So it's all part of the adventure. My feet aren't looking too good. The blisters are just peeling off all over the place. Today didn't help walking through loads of boggy areas. Hopefully I can dry them out overnight, put some fresh socks on in the morning and they'll heal up in the next few days. We're a lot higher up uh, on the top of the mountain tonight and it's a lot cooler than it was last night but still not too bad. I've managed to make a nice little pillow out of this dry bag full of clothes. Works quite well. I think it's time to hit the sack. Time to hit the dry bag. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all well last night. I've got stuff coming out of my ear that I don't even know what it is. Definitely got a pretty bad ear infection, so I just can't wait to get warm and dry and try and heal. Theo's cold had begun to transform under the constant rainfall. With perforated eardrums, his risk of developing an ear infection was high, a situation which unfortunately seemed to be unfolding. The boats were due to be removed from the lake on September 20th. It would be a massive blow if we missed them, as the alternative would require a major trailless detour to reach Yakvik. We were nearing Lake Reibness and picked up patchy signal, allowing us to call the private boat in advance to let them know of our arrival. They'd said we could cross that afternoon, so we had high hopes of possibly reaching Yakvik that evening, as we'd read the trail was only eight kilometres from the other side of the lake, which also included another lake crossing of 300 metres that can only be crossed by rowboat. Unfortunately, our timetable lay in the hands of the boat driver and we had a three hour wait in the rain before he arrived. We're just waiting to get the mobo over to the other side of this big lake. It's the last boat we're gonna to have to pay to use to get across on the Kungsladen Trail. After we reach the other side, there's then, I think of roughly about eight kilometer trek to Yukvik. But during that time, there's also a 300 metre rowboat session as well. So it's going to be a pretty long day today, but we really need to get somewhere warm because both our shoes are for some reason absolutely drenched and two days of soggy feet does not make a happy person. It's just been raining constantly since we left Kvikjok and um, this section of the trail that we're on is uh, like the wildest section. So. There aren't as many boards and all that kind of luxurious stuff that there usually is, so it's been very wet going with the rain on top. Both of our waterproof boots are drenched. 
so it's not been the most comfortable experience. I'm hoping that after we get to Yupvik and we can dry out, the, the second half of the wild section will be more enjoyable and hopefully, even if it does rain, our boots will stay dry this time because it, it is beautiful when the clouds clear and you can see your surroundings, but right now you, you can't even see to the other side of the lake, so I think we've missed a lot of the beautiful scenery that we could have seen, which is a shame. The cost to cross the lake is the highest along the Kungslade and at 350 crowns each. The journey is short and the company hostile. We'd heard from other hikers who'd crossed the lake coming north that the guy running the boat here wasn't the nicest and now we knew why as he ignored us for the full five minute crossing. Having to wait up to three hours to cross the lake, we had now missed our opportunity to hike to the open shelter at the next lake crossing eight kilometres away. Push out. The hostel and a chance to dry off was still a day away, and after checking our map, it turned out the distance to Yakvik was double what was in the guide we'd been following. I hope it's not the bow we've got to use. It doesn't look very rowable. So because there's only one boat on our side, I've got to row across the lake to the other side, pick up another boat, bring it back, drop it here, and then row us both back to the other side of the lake. So three times in total. I'm feeling pretty dizzy. My balance is a bit off with this ear infection, but it doesn't look too far, probably about 300 metres, so it's got to be done. So I'm back over this side after towing the boat over here and we're gonna head off now because it's just started raining and it's about to get a lot heavier. By now we were wet through to our underwear and had run out of dry clothes. The desperation to reach a warm shelter was high. We just saw a moose trotting through the forest at the edge of the tree line and uh, sadly the moment the camera got pulled out it had vanished. But it was massive and I can't believe we've just seen one after being literally in the middle of nowhere for three days and now we're on a road. <laughs> And there was one right there because we've seen so many moose droppings over the past few days. So the moose that we saw running through the forest is still in the forest right where we saw it. It's just kind of shaded by some trees. It's just standing there, not moving a muscle. <laughs> Theo managed to pick up signal on the outskirts of town, calling the hostel to check availability. It turned out it was fully booked. 
A stroke of luck saw us staying in a cabin the kind hostel owner had on his property, so we spent two nights in the town of Yakvik, giving us the opportunity to dry out all our belongings and restock our supplies. So this is a um, small garage, well, normal-sized garage that's got a small supermarket inside it where we've managed to get food to last until we reach Amarnas, so the general stuff, noodles and things like mash and three minute rice like it's pretty bland but it means that we'll be getting to eat food <laughs> until we reach the next place because you need stuff that's going to cook fast and not weigh too much so but also because we're staying in this cabin we've got access to an oven and stuff that we don't usually have we've decided to like treat ourselves and get other things like um, some waffle mixture uh, fresh fruit, which is going to be amazing, and um, a pizza kit. <laughs> Our gear could completely dry out during the two nights we spent there, and a solid day's rest made a world of difference for us both. Spirits buoyed with the extra rest and thorough drying, restocked bags and lots of ibuprofen, we made our way to Adolfstrom, our last dip into a town before being completely cut off again. From Yakvik onwards, there are shelters and cabins along the rest of the trail, so if we could avoid tent time, then we would, at all costs. We spent last night in Adolstrom, in this perfect little cabin. It had everything we need, but it's very compact. Today we've got 23 kilometres to do, then the next day 25, and then the day after that, we arrive in Amanes, which is, I think, a 21 kilometer hike. So, a tough three days ahead of us, but we're feeling good. The small town of Adolstrom is a 27 kilometer hike from Yakvik, with a small shop to grab any extras for the next 71 kilometers before the town of Amanes. Got it. It was well over a kilometre back. I bent round the corner. I was about to give up, and there it was lying on the path. I'm glad I've been reunited with it, because no one needs to see my hair in the state that it's in at the moment. <laughs> When we came around the corner and saw this cabin, I was just so happy because along the route we spoke to loads of different people and everyone seems to have a different uh, idea of what this cabin is. Loads of people have said it's just a wind shelter, you know, it might not even have a door and all these kind of different things about this cabin and we got here and it's really nice and it's perfect to sleep in. So I've just got the fire going. Hopefully we can dry our boots out before the morning because I'm not a fan of putting wet boots on and I've had to do it a lot uh, recently. Wet socks, wet boots, no fun. I love being in a tent but to have actual walls around you is a lot nicer, especially when it's pretty windy out. Amanus lay a day's hike away, and the need for rest pressed heavily on us. Theo's ear infection still troubled him, with fluid constantly seeping out, day or night. My hip problems were getting increasingly worse, and together we longed for a day's rest, a shower, and the possibility of some food other than three-minute rice. Justina had been in touch, informing us they'd journeyed from Amanus a week before. The chance of crossing the finish line together now was no longer an option. After the past tough 10 days, we expected the last stretch to be a lot easier.
With 78 kilometres to go until the finish line in Hemavan and a few days rest in Amanus, we entered the last stretch with a renewed sense of vigour. The end was in our sights and winter was beginning to bite at our heels. The area was outstanding and we were ecstatic with the clear views after being covered by clouds and fog for so long. Wide open spaces and golden forests broke up the landscape. If only we could have seen what awaited us in the coming days. Thinking we were the only people around, we were in for a wonderful surprise as we met two local fishermen staying in their ancestral family cabins for the season at Lake Tarnasio. They had kindly offered us some freshly caught fish along with some instant mashed potato. Potato oh, is most to thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We have we have only fish two days. Ah, okay. Mm. What type of fish is it? It's uh, in Swedish we call it öring. Öring. Like lux. Okay. Like a, a lux fish. Uh huh. Mm, öring. Uh, in restaurant, this is a very special fish. Ah, okay. Mm. Calling röding. Okay. Röding red. The, mm -hmm. the color is red. Ah. And röding. Very special. You must have one fish for you and one for your boyfriend. <laughs> yes? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing this with us. It's very kind of you. It's really kind of you. We look forward mm. to eating them. Mm. <laughs> with the amenities in the cabin being a frying pan and some salt, we cooked up a meal we never dreamed we'd encounter along the trail. They're cooking perfectly on this wood burner. I've never really cooked fish like this before, so I just literally chopped the heads off and just back them in the pan. But they smell real good, so as long as the meat is cooked, I don't see why they won't taste good either. Especially with the mash that the man gave us as well, which is really sweet. This is like a proper, proper dinner, which I've just have missed so much since we've been hiking for nearly a month now. Leaving Tarnasio, there are a network of bridges spanning the Tarnasio archipelago, midway to Cytostugan. We're now approaching bridge number five. By now all the huts were closed for winter, but there's always a room left open for anyone hiking out of season. It was a stark contrast to the busy huts of the north, especially as we hadn't seen another person on the trail since Quickyok, ten days earlier. I'm so happy that you can't record the smell of uh, my feet right now. It dawned on me today that we've done already, like, 400 and something kilometers and it's just catching up now. I suddenly just feel the exhaustion of four weeks of non-stop hiking and I'm just totally shattered. Like when we started this southern section I, I remember saying to Theo it's going to be so easy we're only doing 14 a day or whatever. Today was the hardest 14 kilometers. My feet are just broken. I have no energy. I'm just I'm so tired. <laughs> The Kungsleden is now taking its energy toll. I need to sleep. I need to eat. I just want to eat. We haven't seen anyone hiking for nearly two weeks, which is kind of strange really, because in the north section we see people every day. And 
Today I woke up, rushed to the window and had a look out to see what the weather was like and there's a lot of fresh snow on the mountain tops which kind of means the weather's changing and the seasons are changing and this is kind of the last time that you'll be able to hike the trail. We're very late in the season to be doing it and I think we're definitely the last people uh, who are going to complete the trail. It wouldn't be fair to have a breezy last two days along the trail, and with a blizzard pushing against us to Viterskalstugan, it was a reminder of the harsh environment we've been journeying through and how quickly the weather can change in the mountains. Coming down pretty hard. This isn't very nice. Hopefully we'll get to the emergency shelter in the next few kilometers. We'd made it into our final valley and our harshest weather along the trail so far. Completely exposed, it was a welcoming sight to spot the emergency cabin midway to our final cabin on this journey to hide in for a while. That was relentless the whole way. We had rain, sleet and snow in our face. It was pretty hard work, plus the wind was coming at us so it was a lot harder to walk, but I did kind of enjoy it as well because coming into the valley there was the fresh snow on the peaks and the mountains either side, it was really beautiful. Also we stopped off at the emergency cabin so that gave us a bit of uh, rest from the snow and the wind and the rain and yeah, allowed us to just have a break, get some chocolate down us and then head on and get to this cabin. And now we've only got 11 kilometers to go until we've completed the Kungsleden. I've never appreciated the wood burners in any of the cabins as much as I have today. It's gonna dry our clothes out hopefully, warm us up, and we can cook on it later. The snowfall grew heavier and heavier, and as we went to bed, it had already completely blanketed the landscape. We were preparing ourselves for a whiteout the following morning. A fierce storm had descended upon the valley in the night, rattling the cabin and flinging the door wide open. The extreme weather called for full body armour along the last 11 kilometres before Hemavan. Insanely strong wind and hail battered us body and spirit. It felt as if we would never make it to Hemavan. Our GoPro took the full brunt of the weather, but the stormy horizon had a beautiful side to it too. And there it was, the final few steps were unbelievable. After 440 kilometers through Arctic Sweden, on day 30, we'd finally made it.
probably the best boat ride I've ever been on. Yeah. So nice. So all of our hiking gear is up here in the storage. And we got six people sleeping in here tonight. It's gonna smell ripe in the morning. It's like wherever I point it, the fog is over your face. 